You'll find all over the landscape, people presume that those that hold conspiracy theories are some kind of wacko nuts. Now, it intrigues me that, in fact, part of the mission statement of one of these ministries claims to be an expertise in watching conspiracy theories, and yet it's obvious, as we look at their publications, they are simply uninformed. This came up in a discussion with Chuck. They started to talk about conspiracy theories, and Chuck stopped him at the comma. He says, wait a minute, didn't you hear the State of the Union address the other day? And if you were paying attention, you saw global, 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 global. And I want to hit this one head on because there's a concept being promoted in the mainline media that anyone that adheres to the, some kind of conspiracy pushing us towards a world government are somehow worthy of ridicule. And uh, the standard attack on these views maintains that the New World Order is the result of a turn-of-the-century right-wing, bigoted, anti-Semitic group of racists acting in the tradition of the long-ago debunked Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion and so forth. Now, admittedly, on the landscape, there are some weird groups promoting some weird ideas, but these are peripheral, have little to do with this tide towards the New World Order. The historical record, if you do your homework, does not support these positions that are promoted by the mainline media or by people who would uh, seem to uh, uh, be with it, theoretically are within the body of Christ. The New World Order term has been used thousands of times since the turn of the century, not by the right, but by the left that's promoting it in, 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 in high places of our federal government. Those involved in promoting the so-called New World Order uh, some of them, a few of them have been Jewish. The preponderance have not. And so this is not some kind of Jewish plot as some of these anti-Semites would like to promote. Let's take a look at the reality. For years, leaders in education, in the industry, in the media, banking, have promoted uh, 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 a worldview that is equivalent to theirs. You say that, gee, just because some individuals uh, promote a common viewpoint, that doesn't constitute a conspiracy. Well, that's true, except some of it has been somewhat underground, but it's now become a very open conspiracy. And it was described by Fabian Socialist H.G. Wells in a book called The Open Conspiracy, Blueprints for a World Revolution, published in 1928. But you can go back to 1913 as another example. This is prior to the passage of the Federal Reserve Act, which, of course, is neither federal nor a reserve anyway. President Wilson's... President Wilson's The New Freedom was president of the Council for Foreign Relations, Leslie Gelb, said on the Charlie Rose Show, you, that is Charlie, had me before uh, to talk about the New World Order. I talk about it all the time. It's one world now. The Council, meaning the CFR, uh, can find, nurture, and begin to put people in the kinds of jobs this country needs. That's going to be one of the major enterprises of the Council under me. The present CFR chairman, John J. McCloy, this is from about 53 to 70, actually said they have been doing this since the 1940s and before. The thrust towards global government is well documented. But at the end of the 20th century, it does not look like a traditional conspiracy in the usual sense of a, a secret cabal of evil men meeting clandestinely behind uh, closed doors. Rather, it is a networking of like-minded individuals in high places to achieve a common goal, as described in Marilyn Ferguson's 1980 insider classic, The Aquarian Conspiracy. Now, perhaps the best way just to get a flavor of this whole thing is to take a look at the, a brief history of the New World Order. Not in our words, but in the words of those who have been striving to make it real. In 1912, Colonel Edward Man, uh, Mandel House, a close advisor to Wilson, publishes Philip Drew Administrator, in which he promotes socialism as dreamed of by Karl Marx. The next year, 1913, the Federal Reserve, which I think most of you realize is neither federal nor a reserve, uh, is created. It was planned at a secret meeting in 1910 on Jekyll Island in Georgia by a group of bankers and politicians, including Colonel House. And uh, this transferred the power to create money from the Treasury of the United States government to a group of private bankers. It is probably the largest generator of debt in the world. On May 30th, 1919, prominent British and American personalities established the Royal Institute of International Affairs in England and the Institute of International Affairs at the U.S., at a meeting arranged by Colonel House, attended by various Fabian socialists, including noted economist John Maynard Keynes. Uh, two years later, Colonel House organizes the Institute for International Affairs into the Council for Foreign Relations, the CFR. 
And uh, uh, on December 15th of 1922, the CFR endorses world government in its magazine of foreign affairs. Philip Kerr there wrote, Obviously there's going to be no peace or prosperity for mankind as long as the earth remains divided into 50 or 60 independent states until some kind of international system is created. The real problem today is that of world government. In 1928, a book called The Open Conspiracy, Blueprints for a World Revolution by H.G. Wells published. And, and, and that's where he said, The political world of the open conspiracy must weaken, efface, incorporate, and supersede existing governments. The open conspiracy is the natural inheritor of socialist and communist enthusiasms. It may be in control of Moscow before it is in control of New York, but the character of the open conspiracy will now be plainly displayed. It will, in 1948, Britain's Sir Harold Butler in the CFR's quarterly called Foreign Affairs sees, quote, a new world order, close quote, taking shape. Quote, How far can the life of nations which for centuries have thought of themselves as distinct and unique, be merged with the life of other nations? How far are they prepared to sacrifice part of their sovereignty without which there can be no uh, effective economic or political union? Out of the prevailing confusion, a new world is taking shape, which may point the way toward a new order. That would be the beginning of real United Nations, no longer crippled by a split personality, but held together by a common faith. 1948 UNESCO president and Fabian socialist Sir Julian Huxley calls for a radical eugenic policy in UNESCO, its purpose and philosophy. He states, quote, Thus, even though it is quite true that any radical eugenic policy of controlled human breeding will be for many years politically and psychologically impossible, it will be important for UNESCO to see that the eugenic problem is examined with the greatest care and that the public mind is informed of the issues at stake that, is, that much that is now unthinkable may at least become thinkable. You see, they chip away, inch by inch, their patient. Also in 1948, the preliminary draft of a world constitution is published by the United States ed educators advocating a regional federation in, on the way toward world federation in our government, with England incorporated into a European federation. The constitution provides for a world council with a chamber of guardians to enforce the world law. Also includes a preamble calling for the nations to surrender their arms to the world government and includes the right of this quote, Federal Republic of the World, close quote, to seize private property for federal use. On February 9th, 1950, the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee introduces the Senate Concurrent Resolution 66, interesting number, uh, which begins, whereas in order to achieve universal peace and justice, the present Charter of the United Nations should be changed to provide a true world government constitution. This resolution was first introduced by, in the Senate in September 13th, uh, 49, by Senator Glenn Taylor in Democrat in Idaho. Senator Alexander Wiley, Republican of Wisconsin, uh, said that uh, it's a consummation devoutly to be wished. For he said, I understand that your proposition would either change the United Nations or change or create by a separate convention a world order. Senator Taylor later stated, quote, we would have to sacrifice considerable sovereignty to the world organization to enable them to levy taxes in their own right to support themselves. On April 12th of 1952, John Foster Dulles, again, he said in a speech to the American Bar Association in Louisville, Kentucky, quote, treaty laws can override the Constitution. He pointed that out. He says treaties can take power away from Congress, give them to the president. They can take powers away from the states, give them to the federal government or to some international body. They can cut across the rights given to the people by their constitutional Bill of Rights. A Senate amendment proposed by Republican Senator John Bricker would have provided that no treaty could supersede the, unit, uh, the Constitution. But it failed to pass by one vote. Interesting. Interesting. Now, as you read this history, you stop and think, I don't know if you visit Yosemite National Park or Yellowstone National Park, but you may be aware from newspaper articles that they are now policed by the United Nations. They're not a national park because we apparently weren't diligent in doing it the way the UN thought it ought to be done, so they've taken them over on the basis of the Heritage Act of 1974. That's kind of interesting. So this isn't academic. This isn't just a history course of people's thinking. It's manifestation of a tide of a conspiracy. When I was in Liechtenstein with our ambassador, Admiral uh, Bill Middendorf, and uh, Howard Phillips, conservative caucus, I remember asking Howard, because he's probably one of the best informed guys in Washington, and a Christian, really growing too, by the way, neat guy. And because of some other uh, uh, flack I was getting recently, I had to refresh my memory on what happened in Liechtenstein, because I had to admit I, was, I, I had forgotten some details, so I called here. Howard, and he filled me in on those details. Uh, but uh, remember, that, also that conversation back then, I asked Howard, I said, you know, I, I really try to get a perspective of the so-called conspiracy thing. 
And he says, Chuck, there isn't one conspiracy, there are many. There's just as many struggles for power within the extreme left as there are anywhere else. The collective effect, of course, is a tide and a trend. And indeed, there is a master conspirator that gave his name to one of the trusts involved. Okay? All right. Now, 1954, Bernard, uh, Pr Prince Bernard of the Netherlands. He establishes a group that's come to call the Bilderbergers, because that's where they met the first time. Uh, international politicians, bankers, and they meet secretly on an annual basis. And the secrecy of those meetings has finally been punctured, and we now know a great deal about them. But anyway, 1958, The World Peace uh, Through World Law was published, where authors Gr uh, Grenville Clark and Louis Son advocate using the UN as a governing body for the world and world disarmament and world police force and so on. 59, the Council of Foreign Relations calls for a new international order. Study number seven issued on November 25 advocated, quote, a new international order which must be responsive to world aspirations for peace, social and economic change, international order, including states labeling themselves as socialists. Read that communist. The only difference, well, a communist is simply a socialist with a gun that's in a hurry. 1959, or somebody, somebody once quipped, I think, that a socialist is a communist who knows what he's doing. Uh, 1959, the World Constitution Parliament Association is founded. It later pro it develops uh, the diagram for world government under the Constitution for the Federation of Earth. 1959, also the mid-century challenge to the United States foreign policy. It's published by the Rockefeller's Brothers Fund. It explains that the U.S., quote, cannot escape and indeed should welcome a task, the task which history has imposed upon us. This is the task of helping to shape a new world order in all its dimensions, spiritual, economic, political, and social. Did you get that? Spiritual, economic, political, and social. September 9, 1960, President Eisenhower signs the Senate Joint Re Resolution 170, promoting the concept of a federal Atlantic Union. An address is later given and called the goal of the government of all the world in which stated, for it becomes clear that the first step of the world government cannot be completed until we have advanced on four fronts, the economic, the military, the political, and social. In 1961, the United States State Department issues a plan to disarm all nations and arm the United Nations. State Department document number 7277 is entitled, Freedom from War, the U.S. Program for the General and Complete Disarmament of a Peaceful World. It details a three-stage plan to disarm all nations and arm the United Nations with the final stage in which no state would have the military power to challenge progressively the progressively strengthened the United Nations. Interesting. 62, new calls for federal, uh, world federalism. And I'm, I'm not going to, I don't want to badger all of these stuff. I'm just trying to give you a flight. This is a tide. It's got a long, deep history. But the labeling, the goals, the insights don't come from the right or the extremists or the militias. They come from the people doing it for anyone that's done their homework. 1963, J. William Fulbright, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, speaks at a symposium sponsored by the Fund for the Republic, a left-wing project of the Ford Foundation. He says, quote, the case for government by elites is irrefutable. Government by the people is possible, but highly improbable, close quote. In 1964, the Taxonomy of Educational Objectives, Handbook 2, Arthur, uh, author uh, Benjamin Bloom states, a large part of what we call good teaching is the teacher's ability to attain effective objectives through challenging the student's fixed beliefs. You see, his outcome-based education method of teaching would be first tried as mastery learning in the Chicago schools. And after five years, the Chicago students' test scores had plummeted, causing an outrage among the parents. But the OBE would leave a, a trail of wreckage uh, wherever it would be tried and whatever, by under whatever name it was used. And at the same time, it would become the, crucial to the globalists for overwhelming uh, and overhauling the educational system to promote attitude changes by the school students. In 1964, Visions of Order by Richard Weaver is published. He describes progressive educators as a revolutionary cabal engaged in systematic attempt to undermine society's traditions and beliefs. In 1967, Richard Nixon calls for a new world order in his publication, Asia After Vietnam, in the October issue of Foreign Affairs, Nixon writes to the nation's dispositions to evolve regional approaches to development needs and to, and the, to the evolution of a new world order. Visual entitlement to food, health, and education. So you get the NSD, America is the main barrier to this all happening, of course, and so that's the focus here. Let me pick 79, an uh, interesting quote from Barry Goldwater, who is retiring as a Republican senator from Arizona. He publishes his, his uh, autobiography called With No Apologies. He said, quote, In my view, the Trilateral Commission represents a skillful, coordinated effort to seize control and consolidate the four centers of power, 
political, monetary, intellectual, and ecclesiastical. All this is to be done in the interest of creating a more peaceful, more productive world community. What the trilateralists truly intend is the creation of a worldwide economic power superior to the political governments of the nation-states involved. They believe that the abundant materialism they propose to create will overwhelm the existing differences. As managers and creators of the system, they will rule the future. In 1985, Norman Cousins, the honorary chairman of the planetary citizens of the, of the world we choose, is quoted in the magazine Human Events as follows, quote, World government is coming. In fact, it is inevitable. No arguments for or against it can change that fact, close quote. He's also, Cousins, also president of the World Federalist Association, affiliate of the World Association for World Federation, headquartered in Amsterdam. And uh, the WAWF is the uh, leading force for world federal government and is accredited by the UN as a, quote, NGO, a non, uh, non-governmental organization, as is the, the, the Alice Bailey's group and so on. 1987, the secret constitution, the need for constitutional change, is sponsored in part by the Rockefeller Foundation. Boy, in, in 1988, former Under Secretary of State CFR member George Ball in the January 24th interview of the New York Times says, quote, the Cold War should no longer be the kind of obsessive concern that it is. Neither side is going to attack the other deliberately. If we could internationalize by using the U.N. in conjunction with the Soviet Union because we now have, no longer have to fear, in most cases, a Soviet veto, then we could begin to transform the shape of the world might get the U.N. back to some, doing something useful. Sooner or later, we're going to have to face restructuring our institutions so that they are not confined merely to the nation state. Start first on regional, and ultimately you could move to a world basis. And on December 7th of 1988, in an address to the United Nations, Mikhail Gorbachev calls for mutual consensus. Quote, world progress is only possible through a search for universal human consensus as we move toward a new world order. Carl Bernstein, of the, of the uh, Woodward and Bernstein fame, if you will, wrote a book called Loyalties, A Son's Memoir is published. His father and mother had been members of the Communist Party. Bernstein's father tells his son in the book about the book, quote, you're going to prove that Senator Joseph McCarthy was right because all he was saying is that the system was loaded with communists. And he was right. I'm worried about the kind of book you're going to write and about cleaning up McCarthy. The problem is that everybody said he was a liar. You're saying he was right. I agree that the party was a force in the country and so on. Oh, I love this one from the World Federalist Association, 1990. It faults the American press. Writing in the Summer Fall newsletter, Deputy Director Eric Cox describes world events over the past couple of years and declares, quote, It's sad but true that the slow-witted American press has not grasped the significance of most of these developments. But most Federalists know what is happening. They are not frightened by the old bugaboo of sovereignty. And, of course, Bush calls the Gulf War a major opportunity for the New World Order and said so before the Congress. Uh, In October 1st, 1990, in a U.N. address, President Bush speaks of the collective strength of the world community expressed by the U.N. as an historic achievement towards a new world order, a new partnership of nations, a time when humankind has come into its own to bring about a revolution of the spirit and the mind and to begin a journey into a new age. Now, the famous talk in 1991, President Bush praises the new world order in his State of the Union message in 1991. He said, quote, what is at stake is more than a small country. It is a big idea. A new world order to achieve universal aspirations of mankind based on the shared principles and rule of law. The illumination of a thousand points of light. The winds of change are with us now, etc. And, of course, many people picked up that buzzword from the, of course, the uh, occultic writings of Bailey and so on. You say, gee, Chuck, why are we getting into all of this tonight? I'm sure I've worried you with more quotes than you really want. The point is, first of all, I want you to be sensitive to the disinformation that is being promoted by people who have an agenda. And that agenda is disinformation. That agenda is to confuse you. That agenda is to somehow lump people who are concerned about this tide of events. And by using smear tactics and trying to color this as if it's some kind of anti-Semitic uh, issue. There are weird groups that like to call it the Jew world order. They point out that some of the bankers in the past happen to be Jewish, and so they try to paint a picture that somehow these ideas are manifestations of some kind of Jewish conspiracy. This is the kind of nonsense you hear promoted by the anti-Semitic extremists. They will uh, harp about a, a document called the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, 
a manifestly anti-Semitic fraud, a hoax that was perpetrated many years ago, is discredited by anyone that has done their homework. But the point is, the fact that there's some of these weird groups, there's an attempt by the government and others to link those with the militias. There are a few that have a militia-like quality, but the point is, the tragedy is there are many uh, militias that are wholesome, straightforward people that are simply seriously concerned about the erosion of our Bill of Rights and so forth. Yeah. Conspiracy. The FBI has just is now enduring the biggest scandal of the entire history of the Bureau because of the tainting of procedures on the Oklahoma City thing. And there's like about a thousand criminal cases of recent years that are being reopened because uh, these guys may, that are now serving time may be released because of the tainting of the handling by the FBI uh, vaunted crime lab. This is the end of side one. Now, there are some people that believe that the government is willing to trash their case against Tim McVeigh to prevent the real truth coming out for John Doe's 1 and 2 and who they were. There's 20 witnesses that have given testimony but are not being called by the government because they apparently don't want that out. And who knows? And, of course, you get into the Vince Foster murder. There's 2,600 pages of depositions you can go through. And you, if you read that, you can't convince yourself that it was a suicide. There's cover-ups. And I understand there's all kinds of new information on the Ron Brown thing also, by the way. And then we have this whole business of TBW 800. It's interesting. Uh, you may be fascinated that on Wednesday, February 12th of 1997, on the Associated Press, a brief report that was quickly squelched, but the report went on the wire as follows. Get this. The White House Commission of Aviation Safety and Security is recommending that the federal government find ways to protect commercial airlines against missile attacks, while insisting, of course, that such attacks are very unlikely. The White House Commission on Aviation Safety and Security suggested a federal task force to develop a plan to protect commercial airlines from surface-to-air missile attacks and to keep such missiles out of the hands of the terrorists. And we've said for some time it's rather provocative that all the evidence out of the ocean has to go to the FBI lab before it's allowed to go to the safety inspectors. It's a managed evidence situation. Now, you say, you know, why are we getting into this? Because, first of all, there's a number of reasons. First of all, it's prophetically relevant. We believe that the stage is being set for global tyranny. We're seeing the positioning going on that's going to make it very, very easy for a world dictator to take control of the structure. We know that the scripture per describes just that, a world leader taking over a federation of global states. Now, one of the other things that bothers me, though, this process is being assisted by the silence from the pulpits. The same thing... The same thing that happened in Nazi Germany. Hal Lindsey's book, The Road to Holocaust, makes the point that you can lay the responsibility for the Holocaust in Europe at the feet of the pulpits in Europe that were silent when they should have been speaking, that bought into the program. And there are people across America today in pulpits that disparage, that, that, that swallow this kind of tripe and uh, that are, are not speaking up in terms of the heritage that you and I are the beneficiaries of. There are a number of pastors that I believe, I'm just expressing a personal opinion here, but that quote from some of the epistles where Paul is talking about a monarchy or the kinds of governmental structures that they were subject to in those days. I don't believe some of those passages apply to us for a very unusual reason. The people that are in Washington are our employees. They work for us. And we have a right to express our views. We have a right to try to cling to the heritage that uh, we have enjoyed for some years. Now, some of the cynics will say it's too late. They may be right. But I think that if you're interested in this area, if this strikes a chord in your heart at all, I encourage you to read the book by Robert Bork, just recently published. Robert Bork, an almost... Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Bright guy. Cares about this country. Read his book. The title says volumes. The title of his book is called Slouching to Gomorrah. And he describes the decline of the United States. He, he, he describes where it's, how it happened. He points out that the flower children of the 60s are a symptom, not the cause. But those kids are now our leaders from the top down. And he, by the time you're through with the book, you'll discover that his, his prescription for America, he thinks America is over unless 
There is a grassroots spiritual revival. And I think if we roll over and just, if we do, there's two things that are uh, errors that we want to avoid. One is to pretend it's not happening. There are prominent ministries that claim to be experts in conspiracy theories that haven't got a clue as to what's going on. So there's some that have their head in the sand and assume it'll all go away if we just ignore it. There are others that are prophecy buffs and it's inevitable, so why do anything about it? And that is irresponsible. I believe that you and I are, uh, are going to be called accountable for our stewardship. Not just of our direct resources, not just of the ways we guys train our kids in the biblical uh, uh, precepts that we are obligated to. Not the wives, the guys. That's what the scripture says. It's, just, it's the guy's responsibility. But I think we're also going to be held accountable for our stewardship of the franchise that God has given us uniquely in this country. We have a representative government. And yes, you can point to maybe a 20% fraud rate in the last election. There are people mumbling about that, but no one seems to care. You may be satisfied with a government that is appointed by one person in four in this country. Only half the people vote and less than half of them put the government in. If you're comfortable with that, great. But I think that's irresponsible stewardship. But you also have something vastly more powerful than the ballot box in the first place. That's your prayer closet. And if you're not on your knees for this country, then you deserve what you're going to get. And I think, and I think it's serious. And I, and I think that that's uh, something we need to deal with. And uh, I think the uh, circumstances uh, we're dealing with are, are serious. Now, it, get broadening it step, one step from the New World Order issue, I'm startled to discover that there are ministries that are trying to portray my wife as a Freudian psychologist. Now, if you know anything about her writings and tapes and so forth, and if you have any idea of the people whose lives have been changed, you know, it's interesting. There again, people are being, in the body of Christ, are being injured by the incompetence and the misinformation that's being promoted within the body by various ministries. Let me give you an example. One of the big disputes that's going on is, has to do with the subconscious. There are people who haven't done their homework that presume that the concept of the subconscious is a Freudian concept. Wrong. That concept is documented over 1,500 years before Freud. How many of you have been either experienced or been taught that if you've got a problem and you're struggling with it, one of the ways to solve your problem is to put in front of you everything you know about the problem put your arms around everything you know about the problem and then put it away and go do something else play a round of golf take an overnight sleep uh, whatever and the morning when you wake up the answer is there how did that happen? because we've discovered by just experience that there's uh, our memory includes functions that are outside our direct conscious control in fact they're very powerful at problem solving among other things the concept, that the, the, the concept of memory, in, in fact, probably a, most of our memory operates by procedures that are not under our direct conscious control. You can call that by many names if you like. Some people call it the unconscious. Some people call it the subconscious. Now we can go. We can go, and I won't, we have an article on our homepage, and it also is published in our March newsletter, giving you a history of the concept of the subconscious. There's nothing necessarily. Now Freud happened to come along, was very obsessed with it, imposed his own particular views on what was going on, and even saw a lot of that even in the field of psych. And by the way, the problem is not the field of psychology. There are people in their zeal to distance themselves from psychotherapy. They throw psychology out the window. Psychology is a broad field of study that has much fruit for us in our society. But the place that all of us, I think, would unite is that psychotherapy has a very dismal history at being effective to solve hurting people's problems. For a lot of reasons. We'll come back to that. But the first point is, there are people that... There, there are two groups. There are those that, that flee to psycho, psychotherapy for healing only to get frustrated because they don't get healed. And the reason they don't is because psychology has, can only deal with guilt, cannot deal with the, that's a symptom, not a cause. The cause is, is sin. And psychology has no answer to the sin problem. And that's in the Word of God. Because psychology can only go to the soul or psyche level. 
Can't go to the spiritual level. Hebrews 4.12 tells us only the Word of God can discern between the soul and the spirit. And that's where the problems are. So psychology is bankrupt in this area. Others deny the existence of the subconscious. And they say, gee, if you accept Christ and, you plead, you know, and, and you're a Christian, then everything's supposed to be fine. And you find people in, ch- in churches that are hurting because they're caught between two extremes and they're denied the remedy, which is to give Christ control of even the hidden faults. Pray with David, Lord, search me and reveal my hidden faults. Hidden from who? From God? No, from David. Do we have faults that are hidden? Absolutely. You don't run to Freudian psychologists to solve that problem. You go to the Word of God. You take it before the throne and let, let God and His flashlight reveal those things and, and bring them to the throne. There's a whole thing there. I'm, uh, I, I don't want to get off on that whole thing tonight. We'll be here all night. But the point is, there are people that... Now, what's interesting, as we publish documents to, to, to distance uh, ourselves from the whole, the whole psychotherapy thing, there are newsletters, Christian newsletters, that are trying to say, well, man is a Freudian psychologist. They impute to her things she never said, and then uh, make and then make mean spirited fun of those. And and the article ends. This is part one of two. You know, that's all we have. We're quite anxious to see what the next one's going to look like. This kind of thing is tragic. Now the good news is, by making this a little bit public, we have been drowned in uh, letters and email and so forth of support. And one of the people that sent me a, a, a encouragement sent me a quote that I'd like to share with you. It never occurred to me. He pointed out the things we're talking about is a form of legalism. I never thought about that. I'm annoyed by the disinformation. I'm annoyed by the fact that the body is being injured by the lies and deceit. But there's another dimension to this that fascinated me. And this is a quote, it turns out, from Max Lucado and is uh, talking about the good guys. Hmm, that's interesting. Think about that on your way home. The Nephilim, which are the offspring of the angels and men, were the reason of the flood of Noah. The problem was a gene pool problem. When, when Satan found out Abraham was going to inherit the land of Canaan, he saw to it that it was populated with post-flood Nephilim. That's why God told Joshua, you slaughter every man, woman, and child of those tribes. That's a pretty weird commandment. Many people have trouble with that, those, those many passages in the Old Testament, particularly in the book of Joshua. What is going on? Uh, Joshua is facing a gene pool problem. Spooky stuff. Do your homework. Now, what happened to the Nephilim in the, uh, before the flood? They drowned, right? What happened to their spirits? Their spirits cannot be resurrected. Isaiah twenty six fourteen tells you that the Rephaim cannot be resurrected. Why? Yes, they're, yes, they're dead, but their dead can be resurrected. We can. They can't. Why can they not be? Because Jesus did not become a Nephilim and die for them. Jesus did not become an angel and die for them. Jesus became a man and died for us. And that's why we have an eligibility that's denied those bizarre creatures. It's my suspicion. I'm just saying this mostly to stir you up to do your own homework. But it's my suspicion that the demons of the New Testament who cannot materialize, they seek embodiment, are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim from before the flood. That's a theory. Check it out. I don't know if it's right. It's hard to find anyone that really wants to deal with the differences between the demons and the fallen angels. They're different. They're different. They're both malevolent, but quite different. Let me uh, ask you to do, take on something else. Well, first of all, let me solicit prayer that uh, God's love will eclipse our frailties and that He will illuminate the path to healing. And that uh, despite all of these things, I often quip as a joke, but it's really very true. If God can use Balaam's ass, he can use any of us. And that God has reconciled himself to use tainted vessels. Pray, pray With prayer and diligence, we hope that despite our shortcomings and our haste and our, our uh, incomplete research and what have you, that uh, we still hopefully can uh, uh, work hard to edify the body. There's a lot of people up in Idaho that are working very, very hard with only one real goal in mind. We're not an evangelistic group. We don't really have evangelistic meetings. Not that we don't do that occasionally. That's not our primary calling. And we're not really an apologetic ministry. There's a number of things we're not really, we just touch on. Our primary calling is to try to edify the body by encouraging taking the Bible seriously. 
and we try to focus primarily on that. And I'm sure we do that quite imperfectly, and yet at the same time we covet your prayers that we might somehow, as things go on, do that more effectively. So we really solicit that. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. And let me remind you again on Valentine's Day, let me remind you of the ultimate Valentine. The Valentine that was written in blood to you and I on a wooden cross 2,000 years ago. I have to give you one other thought. I believe that each of our sins, each of our sins, was felt personally by the Lord as He hung there. I don't think there was some abstraction. I think they were very individually sensible by Him as He bore our sins, every one of them, individually. He felt those on the cross. And as we go forward towards Easter, as we go forward in our Bible studies to focus a little once again on the cross, on Gethsemane, and all and the six trials that occurred that night, let's realize that our sins of next week add to what he felt 2,000 years ago on our calendar. And let's at least close then with a recognition that uh, you and I have gotten the most incredible Valentine conceivable. Let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we just uh, thank you that you love us so much as to go to such extremes that we might have fellowship with you throughout eternity. We thank you, Father, that you have taken our smelly, filthy garments and replaced them with the clean white linen through the blood of Jesus Christ that we can stand before your throne not by our righteousness but by his imputed to us and we thank you father that for our redemption and this day as we celebrate valentine's day father we just come before your throne thanking you for the ultimate valentine and we pray father that as we approach the season which we choose to celebrate these things that you would help us to focus afresh on your word and on those dark hours from Gethsemane to Golgotha. And we thank you, Father, for being our God. And we thank you, Father, for your spirit. We pray, Father, that you would help us to be more discerning. Protect us from deception, Father, not only from without, but from within. Help us, Father, to always remember that we need to test all these things by your word. Not only in its detail, but also in its synthesis, the whole counsel of God. Help us, Father, to apprehend and comprehend 